My name is Megan Keene, and I am Principal Product Marketing Manager at Adobe for Pro Video. I'm super excited to be here with all of our panelists today for our panel, Creativity and Collaboration, Empowering Every Voice. As we all know, in today's remote world, creativity and connection are more important than ever. Film has the power to bring people together, invite new perspectives, and create lasting change, but it's crucial that Every voice can be heard and every story has a chance to be told. With new ways to collaborate and connect across cities, states, and even countries, we have an exciting opportunity to inspire new voices and discover new stories. And no one knows better than our panelists today, telling many diverse stories across the group. So without further ado, I'd love to get started and introduce our panelists. First, we have Brooke Stern Siebold who is a non-binary filmmaker and artist born and raised in Tucson, Arizona. Her work investigates gender and identity through writing, directing, editing, producing, and daydreaming. Brooke has cut five feature films, including Alaska is a Drag, which can be seen on Netflix, and Framing Agnes, premiering at the festival this year, which she also co-produced. Brooke also cut and co-produced Framing Agnes the Short, which premiered at Tribeca in 2019. In 2007, Brooke, Brooke co-directed the feature doc Red Without Blue, which won the Audience Award at Slamdance and the Jury Award at Frameline. Brooke recently served as story consultant on the Amazon doc series Always Jane. Currently, she edits the Emmy-nominated series, Brief But Spectacular, which airs weekly on PBS NewsHour. Brooke loves crystals, doggies, triangles, and they, them pronouns sometimes. Welcome, Brooke. Thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you. Next, we have Malia Mungu Muhande, who is a Congolese documentary filmmaker and artist based in New York City. In 2020, she directed a six-week film program for underrepresented teens in Monticello, New York. From that program came her documentary in progress near Broadway, co-created with her students about their lives in the economically depressed town and in the U.S. as it exists today. Muhande's short documentary, Nine Days a Week, on the 80-year-old African-American New York City street photographer Louis Mendez, was screened in the fall of 2020 as part of the Doc NYC Film Festival, was selected by the National Board of Review, and will screen as part of the Sundance Ignite program here at the festival. She is currently working on expanding this short into a feature film. Welcome, Malia Mungu. Thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you for having me. And next we have Lam Wen. Originally from Colorado, Lam Wen found his passion for film and video production at the University of Denver. Since coming to LA to pursue editing, Lam's career has flourished, leading him to work with many award-winning directors and producers, including multiple collaborations with Timur Bekmembetov. His recent work includes Carrie Williams' R hashtag J for Boslev's and Interface Films, a fresh modern retelling of Romeo and Juliet, that premiered at 2021 Sundance Film Festival and 2021 South by Southwest, earning Lamb a special jury editing award. In 2022, Lamb has reunited with Carrie on Emergency for Amazon Studios and Temple Hill Entertainment. Their successful collaboration led to the film's premiere here in the U.S. dramatic competition at the 2022 Sundance Film Festival. Welcome, Lamb. Thank you so much for being here with us. Hi, thank you for having me. And finally, we have Lynn Sisson Talbert. Lynn stands tall as one of the most accomplished female producers in Hollywood. Recently, Sisson Talbert produced Netflix's original first ever live action musical, Jingle Jangle, A Christmas Journey, and authored the Jingle Jangle book series, including The Perfect Gift, The Square Root of Possible, and Jingle Jangle, The Invention of Geronicus Jangle. Heralded by Variety as 2021's class of producers to watch and on the heels of her groundbreaking musical, Sasan Talbert inked a first look film deal with Netflix launching Golden Alchemy Entertainment alongside her husband. 
So Sun Talbert's other film producing credits include Fox Searchlight Baggage Claim and Universal's Almost Christmas, both of which opened as the number one comedy in America. Recently, Lynn has served as an industry expert and mentor for The Great Untold, an Adobe partnership with Netflix that gives emerging creators creative support, mentorship, and a greater platform to bring their stories to life. Welcome, Lynn. Thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. <laughs> awesome. Um, so let's get started. Um, I'd love to start out with each of you giving a little bit of background on sort of the perspective that you're bringing to this uh, panel and, you know, the your recent project. Um, Lynn, I would love to start with you um, talking a little bit about The Great Untold, how you got involved and, and sort of why you even chose to participate with, with what a busy schedule you have, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, um, how we got involved with The Great Untold was, you know, on our sets, it's always very important for us to mentor upcoming filmmakers. Um, we always have like a group of people coming through being able to see what's going on live and in person. And um, Netflix saw that about us and, and wanted to include us in this amazing opportunity with Adobe. So it was very natural for us to be involved with Adobe and help a new up and coming filmmaker um, bring his vision to life. So that's kind of been our thing because we didn't necessarily have that available to us. We were kind of like on an island and, 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 being in the days of no social media, you know, uh, cell phones, you know, just starting to be as fabulous as they are, um, you know, you were kind of on your own doing research and and trying to connect with people um, in person. So that was the whole thing behind it and the inspiration behind it. And we were just so excited to be a part of bringing these new voices and new fake new filmmakers' visions to life. Yeah, and so we'll we'll drop a link to the Great Untold so people can learn a little bit more about the program and and how you participated. It's really inspiring the work that you guys did with Samba and Adobe and Netflix. Um, next, uh, Brooke, can you give us a little bit of background on on your project um, that's in the festival this year and and sort of the role that you played? Sure. Um, yes. So I um, I co-edited this documentary and then I also co-produced it. Um, I'm excited to be here on this panel about collaboration because this is a really special collaboration that I have with this director. It's our fourth film together. Um, and the film is called Framing Agnes, and it's a feature expansion of a short that we did a handful of years ago. Um, it's, it is about uh, Agnes, who is a trans woman in the mid-century who basically lied to doctors and gamed the system in order to get her gender confirmation surgery. And this film is about how she did that and then also um, a multitude of other untold trans stories from that same time period. Um, Agnes is the one story that's sort of been codified in, um, you know, medical documents and uh, publications. And um, this, this film sort of unpacks that story and how um, there were other stories that weren't being shared in that same way. And so through never before seen case files and reenactments, we get a chance to um, learn about uh, a handful of trans stories in the mid-century. So um, it's a hybrid. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah, ahead, yes, continue. Ahead. I was going to say it's a it's a hard film to sort of capsulize because it's a hybrid experimental doc narrative. It's got a lot going on, so it's it's sort of difficult to put it into a couple of sentences. For those that are building their sort of Sunset Sundance schedule, what they're going to watch, it is in the next category, Framing Agnes. So yes. uh -huh. just so everybody knows where to look. <laughs> um, Malia Mungu, can you go next? Just tell us a little bit about the the project um, that you're you know showing as part of Ignite this year. Uh, so I'm originally from the Democratic Republic of Congo. And um, I moved to New York about three years ago. Um, to pursue this dream that really did seem far-fetched for the longest time. Um, and my first short documentary is Nine Days a Week, which will be premiere, well, screening at Sundance um, this year. And it's going to be showcasing as part of um, the Sundance Ignite and Adobe program. And the film is about an 80-year-old uh, street photographer who started his journey uh, at the age of 17. And every single day, he leaves the house with the 1940 press camera to take pictures of people that talk to him. 
Um, it's very exciting for me to be here. My role um, in the film, I've basically, as an emerging filmmaker and in the dark world, I have kind of just taken on several caps. Um, so I produced the film, directed it, shot it, um, did some sound for it. But then again, that's why I'm glad to be here and speak about collaboration because as the journey evolved, I did bring along um, some of my friends um, to support me with sound, with cinematography. And um, I'm just excited to be here with these amazing filmmakers to also learn more about collaboration and share what I know so far. Well, thank you so much for being here with us. <clears throat> and Lam, could you tell us a little bit about your project? Congratulations. You you know, Lam was part of um, our Sundance panel last year. And so excited for you to, for you to be back, 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 in the virtual environment of Sundance. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, thank you for having me again. Um, yeah, I'm the editor for, for this film, Emergency. And uh, Emergency uh, is an expansion from a short as well. Um, I wasn't a part of the short, but it was a short that Carrie Williams did uh, a couple of years ago. And it, it won at Sundance and at South by Southwest. So um, this is my second collaboration with Carrie Williams. We got to reunite on this again. And yeah, Emergency is about, you know, uh, a story about two two black friends. You know, one's a, a straight A college type student, and the other has a social socially conscious mind. And they both have different views on on social issues around the world. And it's a comedy. And what's great about comedy is that it, it invites um, the audience with a different perspective on on what's going on around in the world. And um, but it's also a, a drama thriller. So it's definitely going to be a fun ride. And um, it touches on a lot of topics, but uh, we it, it's going to be it's going to be cool to see the perspectives that these characters walk through and for us to experience it along the way. Awesome! I can't wait to see it. Um, so, as you guys have mentioned, this this uh, panel is about creativity and collaboration, and obviously, you know, the last two years have been a lot. I'm not going to sugarcoat that. But it's also brought a lot of evolution in terms of, of how we collaborate, how we connect creatively with each other. Um, Brooke, I know that Finding Agnes actually started before the pandemic started. So I'd love for you to talk about sort of how your creative process and the way that you've approached collaboration has had to evolve over the last few years, but also sort of since the start of the project. Yeah, absolutely. And also just to note, it's a framing Agnes, not binding Agnes. Um, but um, yeah, we started filming Framing Agnes before the pandemic. We Well, we started with the short a handful of years ago, um, which, uh, you know, we kind of quickly realized there was more to the story and there was more we wanted to investigate. Um, but, you know, there were so many pivots, obviously, with the pandemic in terms of like the logistics of our creative collaboration. But then there were also... Um, you know, when you're making a documentary and the world is changing in so many fundamental cultural ways, uh, that is also impacting the shape and direction of the story. So I feel like we were both sort of, the experience of making Agnes has been like shaped not just by like how we had to pivot in terms of like how we execute our creativity and collaborate in that way, but also like what it is that we're making because that changed so profoundly as the world was changing. Um, and, you know, my collaboration with Chase, who was once upon a time, a very long time ago, my roommate in life, like 15 years ago, 20 years ago. And um, so the way that we generally collaborate is that we, you know, get together and we have what we call like edit camp. And it's a very immersive experience of like, you know, getting inside of the film and like having this very, very concentrated time to be in that space. Um, and also to like catch up and live life and make nice meals and walk and, you know, do those things. In this instance, it was obviously very different. We had to do everything over Zoom and, um, you know, it was like just trying to sort of like modulate and get on the same page creatively when you're not in the same physical space. So I think it was just like, you know, very frustrating at times, but also like, I mean, there were benefits at times too. It meant that we couldn't work in such a concentrated, like we worked at like, you know, four hours at a time, six hours at a time. It all just looked really different. Um, but, you know, thankfully we've had a couple of moments where we've been able to have, you know, like a couple, a day or two here of like edit camp as we, you know, complete our shoots and whatnot. But yeah, a lot of, you know, for the expanse of the, the pandemic, we were trying to see if we could 
we only had partially shot the film. We still had had like a couple of shoots that we wanted to get that were really like the glue to hold the whole thing together. So it was like trying to make the film work without that um, organizing principle, cohesive thread and, you know, trying to sort of wrap our heads around like, well, how can we make this work with the limitations that we have? And ultimately we were able to get our final shoot once the world opened up a little bit um, and then, you know, sort of edit it together. So it it was like many years of just trying so many different permutations with what we had and also just being open to like, you know, the thesis of the film really shifted into other directions as we became curious about different things as the world changed around us. Um, So I hope that answers the question. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, I know that all uh, of you actually worked on Premiere Pro as you were building um, your films. Brooke, was there anything in post-production or in the way that you worked in in Premiere that, that shifted or changed as you were having to move into this more virtual environment? To be honest, as you're saying that, I think it absolutely should have. (laughs) (laughs) Probably if I, you know, it's like, it's so funny. It's like all of the energy goes into the making of the film. It's like, yes, also if we had put, you know, a different kind of energy into the structure of how to actually sort of do it. But, um, but no, I feel like we were, you know, scrappy indie filmmakers just sort of doing what we do, which is just like every day figure out the you know, figure out this issue. And so, yeah, I would say that it didn't, um, I don't think, you know, as I was mentioning before, like, I don't have a, we didn't have a post production supervisor or anything like that. I think to like create larger systems that probably would have made things a little bit smoother. Um, but yeah, I'm open to those possibilities for future projects. (laughs) Yeah. Um, so Malia Mungu, I know that, you know, in our, in our prep, call for this panel, we talked a lot about the healing nature of of filmmaking and sort of how collaboration isn't just about necessarily creative collaboration, but also finding a support network, finding a a community around the project that you're working on. Can you talk about how the, the way that you collaborated creatively throughout the making of this project um, really um, helped to give you confidence in terms of the, the reality of, of what you were living through. That's yeah. Thank you for asking that. Cause that makes me so comfortable like that. <laughs> um, because, you know, even in my journey of, you know, leaving home and coming alone um, to New York city, I had a plan and part of that plan definitely wasn't COVID. <laughs> um, and I think, I quickly learned that the only way I was going to get through my dream of making this first short film was with the support of those around me. Um, So very quickly, my classmates became my family uh, because, you know, we were all, I was faced with this international decision. Am I going home and not being able to come back or am I staying? Um, So the collaboration aspect of it became, I had this film Um, that I was always passionate to allow the film to have its own life. Um, So I I, I did have an outline, I did have a logline, but part of the process of the film was to spend time with Luis Mendez and allowing the story to unfold the more time we were sharing and the closer we were getting to one another. Um, So when you know, COVID happened in March, um, you know, my whole production got interrupted so all I had was what I had already shot and luckily that was a lot because I was spending a lot of time with Lewis me and the camera filming whatever I could so I was faced with this thing of here is your hard drive here is what you've had what you have what you shot what can you tell um, about Lewis with this footage So um, I went into the editing room and, you know, it it was healing for me to know that, yes, I'm far from home, but I am close to this thing I'm passionate about. And I'm surrounded by other creatives, other filmmakers in the making or filmmakers like the the budding, the budding filmmakers, the sprouts. um, And we're all just like back and forth talking about the film, but also healing through that sort of community and exchange. And, you know, Lynn, uh, you know, it, it it's really reminding me of the work that you did with The Great Untold, because you were working with a 
I mean, talk about first time filmmaker, somebody who really is so, so green. And uh, can you talk about how your collaboration with Samba and your husband, David, and, and how that worked to give him confidence and build him up as a filmmaker to tell that unique story that he had to tell? Yes. Well, we were so impressed um, with his submission to begin with and could see that he was accessing tools and also really having a hard time in the pandemic. And this was his creative outlet, um, which allowed him, you know, this pandemic allowed him to delve more into, you know, the Adobe suite and all the different tools that that were available to him to make his films better. And so when we started t- speaking with him, you know, via Zoom and and going through um, his script and 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 all of that kind of stuff to create this short with him, it I don't I feel like he probably wouldn't have been as far along if it wasn't for the pandemic. And that in his case was really helpful because he was really able to live within his creativity. And once we were able to get together, that was the good part is that we were able to come together to do the short and be live and in person and meet and, and really have the experience and allow him to have the experience to go through, you know, production design and wardrobe and, and, you know, be with his editor in person, which we didn't even have the luxury of doing for our film, um, Jingle Jangle. Um, So that that was something that I realized, you know, I missed, you know, of course, but I was glad that he was able to experience it in a way and grow so quickly by having that time to himself. That's wonderful. And, and you know, so important for young filmmakers to feel like they have this support network, to feel like they have a community around them. Liam, I know that you, I mean, this isn't your first, not your second, but actually your third, your third film within the pandemic. Um, can you talk about, I mean, how your process either has changed or stayed the same in terms of how you're approaching editorial and collaborating um, with directors uh, in this sort of remote world? I mean, yeah. I mean, one of the things that you do miss is the being in person and, and getting the creative juices flowing in the same room. I mean, for the director to see your edit changed instantly in that spot, you could fix things quickly. But um, I mean, I think we've gotten used to this uh, remote cloud workflow. Um, and uh, Carrie and I had to do that all from home last year with with our uh, last feature with Romeo and Juliet. And this one, it was, it was interesting because it was our first next process and working with Premiere and using the Amazon cloud storage and my assistant editors, um, Jamie Blanco and Darnell Stallworth, and an amazing post supervisor, Sherelle Hodges, they live in New York, and I'm I'm editing in LA, and the production was being filmed in Atlanta, and they're uploading footage to a cloud storage server, so it's it's a lot of communication, but um, it's so easy to kind of access one point to the files that we need and reveal footage, and I could do the edits and then send it to Carrie, and then he'll review it, and it. And it's just the the efficiency of, of cloud collaboration is, is great because you can work from anywhere and feel like you're in one space together making this one story. And so um, that, that's my process with that. And, and working with directors, it, it's it's always a communication. And with Carrie and I, we, we're on the phone constantly talking. And it's, it's preparation. You know, we, we prepare as much as we can on what he needs to film. And while I do the edits remotely, he can see what I've done. Uh, I can throw suggestions like, hey, maybe we need this other shot. Maybe we need something else here. He'll add it to the shot list and capture that so that in post-production, when we're when we're actually in editing, we don't need to do any pickup shots. We try to avoid that. So I think re- working remotely during production and all that stuff saves, saves time for the end. I mean, <laughs> Liam, you, of, of the panelists here, you are definitely working in the future in terms of how, how your post-production was set up. I'm very impressed. Um, But it also is really um, interesting to me, you know, so often um, we hear this trope of like fix it in post or like the, the, a downfall of many, especially independent films is that filmmakers don't really think about post until they're in post. And then that's problematic, right? Like there are, there are pitfalls that you can have if you don't really think it through ahead of time. And it sounds like what you're saying is because of this remote environment, 
you had to be thinking through like, how are we going to do this? And how are we going to approach this? Um, are there any other things that have, you know, evolved through this remote collaborative world that you all believe will remain that will sort of affect how you work or how you approach your work um, in the future, you know, as we come out of this pandemic and are able to be maybe with each other more in person, are there things that you will take away from, you know, these last few years and say, you know, maybe I'm going to approach things differently or, or have this affect how I work in the future? Brooke, let's start with you. Yeah, that's such an interesting question because it's been such a mixed bag. I mean, you know, like everyone has mentioned, not being able to be in a room and um, enact a change immediately and then be able to feel it with the director sitting next to me if that's working or not. Like that's such a joy of editing. Um, but I do think, and I, I think a lot of people have had this experience of really retreating to my own space for years, <laughs> is like, uh, has given me just such a different balance, I think, on what I want my life to look like in general. And so the amount of time I'm spending on a screen editing um, added to the amount of time I'm spending on a screen zooming, um, you know, it, it has, has really like forced me to kind of like make sure that I'm a bit more intentional about getting up from the computer, making sure that like my entire life isn't, um, isn't some, isn't through a digital screen. So I think it's just been like a larger awareness around the balance that I need that I think I always needed. Like I always sort of, um, struggled in a, you know, an office environment where you're there for, from nine to five and, you know, surrounded by people all the time. Like there, there are elements of this work environment that I think are really beneficial. And I think uh, for me personally, and I think like a hybrid version of that, where like sometimes you get to work in a space with people, but then also um, have the balance and also like have, have my own space to sort of like do my own work in also has been um, kind of a, a, a gift in some ways. I feel like editors are uniquely positioned to like thrive in a situation where you have to stay at home because it's really just us and a machine in a dark room if that's what we want, you know? So, so yeah, it's been like, you know, life changes that I think will be integrated into how I, how I edit in the future. Also, I, you know, how I choose projects and just again, like the, the, the balance and wanting to create a situation for myself where like I can be as creative as possible in that container. And then also, step away from the computer and like live a uh, present life. Yeah. It's so, it's so interesting because for so long filmmaking and, and, and sort of cinematic storytelling has been so centralized in LA, New York, because that's where the industries are. Right. And now as we are all sort of moving to remote work, whatever industry you're in, you know, there's a great potential that we'll start getting more diverse stories because people are realizing, like, I don't have to be in New York or L.A. in order to be telling these powerful stories. Um, Malia Mungu, I know that you, you know, through your work with these young people up in Monticello, New York, I'm sure we're finding that, that, that the, the ability to understand and sort of grasp technology and storytelling really opens doors that I don't need to be in a specific place in order for my, my story to be important to be told. Could you talk a little bit about that and working with the young people? Yes, for sure. I mean, even as um, Brooke is sharing and the, 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 your question got me thinking about um, accessibility and the importance of user-friendly design, right? So when I think about my kind of first touch po contact point with Adobe Premiere Pro, it was in 2015 in Pretoria, Johann in Pretoria, South Africa, when I was doing my undergrad in multimedia design. And I remember the first lessons that I was getting on Adobe Premiere Pro, my, to my surprise, I was so comfortable. I understood the interface, I understood how the editing process was working. And, and then kind of fast forward to 2020 when, you know, my editing lessons on campus were interrupted. And what the professor wanted to teach us was Avid, but all I had was the access of what I knew, and that was Premiere Pro. And that was the same for a lot of my other, uh, my fellow classmates. So thinking about accessibility and the fact that it was a tool that was user-friendly, that I could understand, 
it gave me the confidence to even teach it to eight students in Monticello. Um, so that power of, you know, taking in information and passing it on, it's empowering. It's, you know, it really fuels me um, and it makes editing so exciting. Yeah, confidence is such an important part of the process that so often I think filmmakers and especially young filmmakers say like, is this really important or should I tell this story because I think this is what other people want to hear about or that, you know, this is what's trending right now. So I'm going to tell that story versus having the confidence to say, this is my story and this is the the important thing that I have to say to the world. Um, Lynn, I'm sure that that came into your conversations um, in working on The Great Untold in terms of not catering to what the world is looking for, but catering to yourself and the story that you have to tell. Absolutely. Um, you know, it's it's such a unique position to be in to, when you've kind of come up in the industry in a very unconventional way. So for for us, there really like are no rules. And to be able to connect with people in this virtual way now um, does open up, I feel, a lot of doors. And we've seen um, some people, this this actual pandemic and all of that, uh, bring about, you know, some new celebrity with people who have taken advantage of this time and, and, and face, face time virtually, right. With an audience that wasn't readily available to them before. And so I, I love seeing the new faces, the new creativity, the new stories being told and stories that weren't necessarily getting as as many eyes as they do now and and people and underrepresented people that weren't getting as many eyes as they are now. So from that perspective, um, you know, it's definitely been a benefit. You know, I still do, of course, miss the in-person energy and, and, you know, with our film all the way down from visual effects to scoring, having to do it in, in this virtual world, but the tools definitely helped with the efficiency of it all. And uh, a benefit on our end, I know, were the visual effects creators that are literally all over the world from, you know, India to Paris to Madrid and, we wouldn't have had the opportunity to really connect with them before because we're always in person with everyone else. And it's just their final pieces that are sent and then one person showing it to us. So I, that was really a benefit and a bonus that we got to jump online with everyone and kind of thank them for their contribution and, and let them know that we do see them and see what they're doing and acknowledge all of that. And I did see how... Uh, it really affected them and and made a difference as far as the work that they were putting in. They they really made it their own. So in that way, connecting with people from all over the world, which we wouldn't have an opportunity to do because we're we're just doing our thing and trying to get the movie made. Um, that that was something special that I appreciated during that time. And Liam, you know, uh, Lynn speaks to like a virtualized world where. It, it enables us to work with people all over the place. You mentioned that in your post-production um, workflow that you were not in the same place, New York, LA. Um, do you believe that this this sort of virtualized environment that, that you guys leveraged for this film will be something that you'll want to use again in the future? Oh yeah, most definitely. I, I think it's going to evolve and, and technology con- constantly gets better uh, every day. So uh, I really believe that. And I think it, it gives a great opportunity for, for other editors and, and new assistant editors and, and new talent to work in the comforts of their home. And and it, it just seems to be more, I mean, I do miss all the in-person stuff. Nothing will ever beat that. And I, I think I believe in that we'll have a hybrid of that where, you know, Carrie and I, we were able to go in and work together at some point too, here and there. And that was great. But I think um, working on this, you know, remotely and virtually and it, essentially from anywhere, you you get a lot more done. I mean, for me, it's just the basic things of, you know, saving you two hours a day of driving on the road. You could do so much more and get things done in those two hours and, and get the work done. So I, I believe in the more time you have to work on a project, the better the, the movie is going to be in the end. So I, I do believe it's going to evolve and I, I hope it does, but I do believe it will. I love that you mentioned the the opportunity to bring in 
you know, new editors, new assistants, new, and, and I, what it makes me think of is, you know, there's a lot of, um, uh, discussion around diversity in front of the camera, but I think that also diversity behind the camera or below the line as is often referenced in, in post-production, in cinematography, in the way that stories are built is also important. Uh, you know, that, that having sort of diverse perspectives every step of the way makes for richer stories. Um, do you agree? And if so, why? Um, Brooke, I'd love to start with you. Oh, yeah. I mean, I so thoroughly agree with that. I um, and the the crew, everyone involved in Agnes is um, I mean, it's just like such a wonderfully diverse group of um, gender, queer, trans, um, non-binary humans and folks. And I think it's um, there are so there are so many ineffable things that that brings to a project that's like it's it's impossible to classify but one thing particularly that kept coming up in our project is that the conversations that were being had were being had because um you know the majority of people in the room had a had a you know some version of their own experience questioning gender in that construct so it was like the level of conversation it's not the level the level is the wrong word it's like it's it's where that group of people is in that conversation it allows for like different openings of different ideas because everyone in that room has considered it for so long. It's the fabric of how we operate. So it's from the sound operator to, you know, editing to co-producing to producers to like every single element is bringing their version of that perspective to it because obviously everyone has their own experience with what that has meant for them. But like, there's something so um, rich about, you know, and then, you know, being able to come to Sundance with this group of people that is like very queer and, you know, just, uh, you know, we're trying to break down the studio system, I guess, from the inside out now or something. But it's like it's exciting to, um, yeah, be uh, in the company of such diverse voices because it's I mean, for me, it's the conversations that I'm interested in. They're just like so alive. It's not theoretical. It's like lived experiences from, you know, from everyone there. Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's, it's like beneficial for humanity to be able to, you know, and, and I've had the pleasure of working on trans themed projects from different perspectives, you know, and, and I think for this one, particularly because of the diversity in the crew and on set, um, it, yeah, like I said, it's just like, it, it allows for so much nuance. Um, and I think it's just so exciting that people are ready to listen to those kinds of conversations. You know, as we had sort of spoken about in our prep calls, like the world is changing so much. So it's like you can make work and then broadcast that into, you know, the void. Um, but suddenly when the collective is like, oh, wait, no, these are ideas that we're ready to engage with. It's a it's a game changer. Um, so it's just really exciting moment. Absolutely. That co collective saying like, this is important. We're all we're we're all saying this is important. The tides start changing, right? Yeah. And it's also just, I mean, how that fuels you as a creator and as an artist is like when um, when the collective is ready to hear as opposed to, you know, just really like so much. I mean, I, I think that the conversation is becoming so much more nuanced and because of different platforms and the democratization and different voices that are being heard, like all of these different things, but like what an exciting time because it means that, you know, we can sort of propel conversations beyond where they've been and like arrive in, in new places. And it's like so interesting because it's like the technology of, you know, having to sort of wrap your head around like, oh, the adaptation of what it is to edit uh, in this new capacity is like it is in every single level of collaboration and creativity and like the ideas that we're having. And like, you know, it's it's just a really exciting time of brand new ways and like systems. So, Liam, yeah. I see you, I see you nodding. What, what do you think? Why, why is it important that we sort of bring in a, a diverse range of voices into filmmaking? I think it, yeah, just look, tailing off what Brooke was saying, I, I think it's great that we get these diverse voices and opinions and perspectives. You know, I, I, I'm a big believer in fresh eyes and fresh perspectives. And I think it's, it's very educational as filmmakers. You, you're always looking out to learn things and to learn other people's views and understand how they feel and stuff like that, I think it helps us as filmmakers to be more authentic in our stories and making our stories and building our characters. So, so that's what I love about this whole 
a new way of filmmaking with post-production and, and how uh, anyone around the world can can collaborate with you and, and, and make the best story out of, out of your film possible. And Malia Mungu, what, how, why, how do you think that we can in, empower more of these diverse voices to get into the, the storytelling process, to, to have the confidence that we've been talking about, to, to you know, believe in themselves and, yeah. and start telling their stories? Yeah, I mean, it makes when you think about documentary, yes, the story is made with the chemistry between the subject and the filmmaker, but the kind of construction of the documentary happened in the editing room. And for me, what was so important about teaching kids between the age of 14 to 17 in the summer program in 2020, I had the chance. We still had it in person. We were kind of in our own bubble. It was, you know, summer camp vibes. But to see what they could have, they, they were able to make in six weeks, you know, they each had access to a camera to tell their own stories and edit it themselves. So that means like sitting, you know, at the age of, you know, between 14 and 17, at that age, sitting behind the computer and knowing that you have the power to stitch the film together, to tell the story the way you want it to be told. And I think the way that we get more people um, like me, <laughs> you know, black, brown, queer people um, to kind of come together across all cultures is to educate the youth because that's the next generation, you know, and by empowering them to cut and edit, it's the most exciting. I think I'm addicted to editing because I know the power of editing. I love directing, but I cannot let go of the like, I need to see every frame and I want to stitch it together because I know what it feels and how fulfilling it is. You know, when I see it all together and I say, I wanted that transition. Um, so education, man, like black kids need to cut. Um, so yeah. And Lynn, I mean, I, it sounds like this is sort of at the heart of everything that you're doing with Golden Alchemy and Netflix. And so talk a little bit about how you believe that we can be bringing in more more diverse voices, telling more diverse stories. Yes, um, and, and Malia makes a good point about the editing, you know, because that is where, where the story is built. You know, I always, um, I always think about a quote that Stephen King said, where he said, um, to write is human, to edit is divine. So I always remember that because the editing process is the most important. Um, but I, I tell you, I, I love Adobe and Netflix because they are trying to literally go after these unique stories of people that are underrepresented, like going into small towns of Alaska or Kentucky or, you know, all these different places trying to push to get a different voice and a different perspective. And I feel that that is what's really needed and important and important to do, sometimes we have to seek it out because the people don't necessarily have the resources. But at the same time, um, you know, it's, it's, now, you know, it's making things available, the tools available for everyone to use, you know, and we do a lot of work with um, historical black colleges as well. And when you look at what the technology is in those schools compared to like a UCLA or whatever, some, you know, you're starting a little bit behind than you would have if you were at a UCLA or USC. So, balancing the education out as well and the tools within the institutions makes a huge difference as well. The alumni that people have access to, you know, trying to trade some of that in so that these other schools and other communities have just as much access to the tools and the people that the bigger, you know, more known schools have. So um, that's really what we're trying to do, you know, with partners like Adobe and Netflix is giving access to people to people that are underserved and 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 undereducated and don't have the same access, you know. So I just get really excited about hearing, you know, and seeing these new voices and new stories and being a part of trying to uplift, you know, their visions. Education and accessibility are really topics that are very much at the core of everything that 
We're doing at Adobe. I know at Netflix, also at Sundance in terms of our Ignite partnership um, and women at Sundance partnership. Um, another thing is mentorship and, and investing in mentorship. Um, I, I know that all, across the board here, there's all um, a different experiences, both in mentoring others, but also in being mentored. And I'd, I'd love to start, Lynn, with you, just talking about the importance of mentorship. Why, why is mentorship so important in this industry? It's so important because when you see someone that looks like you doing what you may want to do, it makes a world of difference. You know, um, it's it feels like it can be attainable and it it access, you know, at the end of the day, it's having access. It's having access to to the environment. It's having access to the people. It's having access to the struggle and the journey. And what what path, what path have I paved so that it's easier for the person coming behind me? Um, all of that is so important. And the mentorship starts there. It's really, you know, it, it can be even just a conversation. You know, it doesn't have to be this full on commitment. If you could just have a conversation with someone that wants to do what you do and give them some insight and some tools, it just makes a world of difference to that person. And I, I always push and, and extend my relationships out for that. And so many people are excited to share um, what their knowledge and their journey with a lot of these students and young, young up and coming filmmakers. So that that's where it all begins. And with, again, with the support of a Netflix and an Adobe, you know, you, you, you can win or at least have an opportunity to win. And what about you, Brooke? How has mentorship come into play in your your career and, and pursuit of filmmaking? Yeah, I mean, I uh, first of all, I feel very like lucky and privileged to have had a series of mentors in my life who have um, both inspired me through like modeling and seeing what they've been able to do in the world, but then have also just like validated my voice and and my work, and I feel like. Um, you know, the horrors of the patriarchy is that, um, you know, not just the gatekeeping and how impossible it is to be able to have our stories seen, um, seen and, you know, validated, but also that we can forget that our stories are important because of that. And so having a mentor who not only can sort of help and shine a light, you know, and, you know, what this industry is and how difficult it is and, you know, uh, maybe provide some advice or, help in terms of, you know, arriving at, at, you know, wonderful projects or wherever it is that you want to be, but also just generally validating that what you have to say is important because it's just so easy to forget. I think, um, you know, ingrained in filmmaking is rejection and how many no's that we are constantly getting all the time. Um, and so like to have a mentor who can remind you of um, the value and importance of what you're doing um, is, you know, also what I love doing for filmmakers that are younger than me that, you know, that, that need it because it's so easy to forget. Um, so yeah, I feel really lucky to have, to have had that. And also it's a, it's a real responsibility and commitment to give that to younger filmmakers because it's, it's so essential and the stories are so important. You know, it's like, we don't, we don't, I get to teach young filmmakers and it's so wonderful to like, see the perspective that they have on the world. And because it is their own perspective, it's easy to diminish uh, its relevance or importance because it's just like, oh, this is just your blue or it's like the water that you swim in and to you know, have mentors who can really guide you and help you and express um, how important what you have to say is so that we can like hear more of it. Uh, it's just so easy to be beaten down as a, as a creative human and um, the support is essential. Yeah, validation, you know, encouraging vulnerability, I think, always brings out stronger stories, you know, more, uh, to Lamb's point earlier, authentic stories. Um, Lamb, how about you? How has mentorship come into play in your in your career? Oh, I'm, I'm grateful for a, for a lot of directors and producers I've worked with. I mean, I've been at this for like 20 years, and I, I really want to thank, like, Rick Ramage. He's an amazing screenwriter. Um, and he gave me an opportunity to edit a couple scenes for his first feature. And I was an intern at that company at that time. And he, he gave me a chance to, to try some and he liked what I did. And that essentially launched my editing career. 
And so, so I always take everything from, from each producers and directors that I work with. And, and Rick, Rick has you know, opened the doors to, to allow me to shadow him on his screenwriting process, how he put stories together on the script, on the page. And I, I, I took that with me to editing because as you all know, editing is the final phase of the story. It's a revision of the script essentially. And you, you make the best out of that. And so I was able to learn a lot from him and he guided me so much through my whole career. And, and just recently, the last couple of three years, um, uh, I have I had new uh, students graduating from film school, reaching out to me, asking for tips and advice. And I always love to give back and give them hope that, hey, you can do this too. And it's funny, like there's a, there's a few students that would, you know, we would get on Zoom call and talk and they, they would ask, you know, do I need a big machine? Do I need a big Mac Pro machine or something? And I'm like, no. You don't need it. You could just get a regular laptop. It's so easily accessible nowadays with Adobe and the editing software, and it's intuitive. You could make movies off your laptop and share your voice to the world. So that's, I, I really believe it's important, and I hope that you know I continue could continue to give back in my ways as well. Emilia Mungo, how about you? I know that you sort of you know have a lot of different ways that mentorship has come into play. Why is mentorship so so important um, in in filmmaking? Yeah, I mean, just listening to you all got me a little emotional. So I just want to say thank you for being mentors. You know, um, <laughs> I'm 26. You know, I'm 26. I am from the Democratic Republic of Congo, and I can attest to the fact that. I would not be here if it wasn't for all the mentors that I've said yes. Um, That's beautiful. I'm sorry. No, don't be. Don't be. <laughs> That's wonderful. Yeah. It's yeah. powerful. Yeah. yeah, it's powerful. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm, I remember my interview with, um, for the Ignite when I made finalist and I landed on the call and it was Marianne that was there and Marianne had like stickers, um, but it, they were pimple stickers, but they were like bright yellow, green. And I remember getting so comfortable because I was like, oh, I, like the first thing it screened was queerness. And I was like, I can, you know, representation right there. Um, and Toby and Kareem have basically catered for me to have Jacqueline Olive, who's a black producer and director as a mentor and having her in my life has just um so I think for me oh god knowing the power that mentorship has had in my life how can I not mentor other people it's as simple as that absolutely life yeah absolutely yeah. Yeah. beautiful Thank you for your vul vulnerability, Malia Mungo. That's, it was really, yeah, lovely. Um, as we wrap great. up, I think that's a great lead in to, you know, one of the m most traditional <laughs> final questions is for all of those young people who are watching this, who are um, guaranteed or watching Sundance, watching the films, what advice do you have for the next generation of filmmakers um, as they embark on this journey? Um, Lynn, let's start with you. Um, I would say there are no rules. Um, you know, your path is your path and it's going to be different from anyone else's. And don't feel like you have to confine yourself to these certain steps. I think going outside of the color lines uh, will often get you closer to where you want to be and, and keep and maintain your unique voice but learn the craft as well. Learn the craft, look at the people that you admire their work and study it and learn and um, keep pushing no matter what. Beautiful, thank you. And Lam, how about you? Yeah, I would say um, so many things. I, I think it's just uh, facing your fears. I, I remember first going into being a filmmaker and making this path. I remember when my professor was telling me uh, she's like, what's wrong? And I'm like, I'm just scared. You know, like you're just scared of how to voice your your work. And she's like, don't be scared. Just believe in yourself. And I really take that to heart. I think, you know, learn the craft, as you know, Lynn said, and and learn the basic fundamentals of editing. But you know, over the years, as it becomes secondhand to you, 
it's really about here, you know, edit, edit with your heart, edit with your emotions and, and feel it, feel, feel the voice and, and really don't be afraid and also have an open mind. You know, I think it's great to, to take all the feedback and try all the notes, all the good notes and all the impossible notes, because it's a domino effect. You start to find new things and new ways to, to make the best out of your story. So it's just, um, yeah, for me, just follow your heart and then believe in yourself and, and have a discipline up in here to, to get it through. Awesome. And how about you, Breck? Wow, I'm just very moved by all of these answers. So I just want to sit in that for a second. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I really think the 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 message for me is is just to be authentic, be yourself. Um, I think that, you know, this this industry can feel so exclusionary and, you know, you can do your best to try to fit in. But um, but but why? <laughs> like, but I feel like we're in this moment of, you know, where our differences are being celebrated. We're arriving at this new place of consciousness. And um, that feels really exciting as a moment to really just like embrace what it is that you have to say. Um, and like everyone else is saying here, I think it's just like develop your practice. And like, I think developing your practice as a way, or at least for me, as a way to sort of like retreat within myself, um, because then your art is really something that just helps you continue to transform and grow as you continue to get older and investigate new and exciting areas in life. Um, so I really think like there's, you know, this just this idea of like your creativity being something that really can grow with you and be a container for um, life explorations. Um, so, yeah, I think I would just encourage to be yourself and to explore what brings you genuine curiosity and joy and just trust that that will take you where it needs to take you. Healing through filmmaking. That's <laughs> As we discussed. That one. Yeah. <laughs> and finally, Malia Mungu, what advice would you have for, for up and coming young filmmakers aspiring to be doing what you're doing? Um, definitely. You know, one of my mentors, Carissa Samuel, um, rest of soul, used to say to me, success is inevitable when you put in the work. And from that sentence, I carry with me all the time. So like my definition of success is definitely being curious, being vulnerable, um, asking for help. Um, that is success to me, is if I can show up today um, and just be my full self, you know, I'm in the process of healing, decolonizing myself, unlearning, finding myself and showing up here as that, showing up in front of my computer with that, you know, like Lam was saying, it's in the heart. Um, and I think if we put in the work to be better human in this world, we'll create beautiful work because we're being honest and we're going to connect with the purest and most genuine, authentic definition of what it means to be human and that is you know to disconnect with one another um, and if that can translate into the work we put out in the world um, I think that I mean I can only speak to what I know and that's what I'm trying to do today and every day as I grow in this um, industry so that's what I got. <laughs> I love that as a place to end Brooke, Malia Mungu, Lynn, Lam, thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you to the audience joining live. Enjoy the rest of Sundance. Congratulations again to all of you. And thanks again for joining. Thank you, thank you so, you so much. much.